Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you because we know you truly are higher than any other. Your healer, your redeemer, and we are so very, very thankful, Lord. God, I lift up this message tonight, and I pray that um, just that your Holy Spirit will be here, that it will be real and tangible and palpable. And I pray that regardless of the words that I speak, that each person here walks away with what you want them to know. God, we love you and we give you all the glory. Amen. Okay, so the last few weeks we've been forgetting to um, do the offering. And so um, what we're going to do, AJ's just going to walk around. I'm going to start the message. And so if you have um, something to put in, and remember if you have change, um, all the, the loose change offering is going to Zoe Ministries. And so... Uh, which is an orphan empowerment ministry that we're really excited about, and we'll have an empowerment group in Zimbabwe. So tonight is the last message on our sermon series on how to neighbor. And um, let's see, we've talked about, we've, this is week four, and um, the phrase how to neighbor comes from the great commandment. So to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. So we've been talking about different ways to love our neighbors. So you guys probably can, can do this better than I can. But we, So we talked about the races reconciled. We've talked about orphans embraced. We've talked about the poor empowered. And tonight is the final night and we're talking about loving the lonely. Loving the lonely. So I want you to just think about it. You can close your eyes if you want. Think about who do you know who's lonely? Who in your sphere of influence is lonely? Think about it for a moment. Okay. I'm going to open your eyes if they're closed. You know, if we go back to way, way in the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the very first story, the creation story, and God makes everything. And what does he say? He creates something and he says, and that is very good. It's very good. But then he makes Adam. And Adam's alone. And what does he say? He said, it is not good for man to be alone. Because, see, we as human, human beings, we are created to be in connection with one another. So we are not created to be solitary beings. We are created for connection with one another. Um, and loneliness is a growing problem for us in first world countries. And it's what we would call relational poverty. So the reality is that you can be around a lot of people and feel very alone. And maybe that's something that you guys have, have experienced before. You can sit in a crowded church and feel very lonely. You can be a stay-at-home mom, be surrounded by little kids, and feel very lonely. You can be at work, you can be surrounded by a, a plenty of coworkers, but not feel close to any person and feel very much alone. You can be a college student living in a dorm with all these people around you, day and night, and you can still feel isolated and by yourself. You can be in a dysfunctional marriage and literally be sleeping next to someone every single night and yet feel so alone. So last week, remember, we talked about material poverty. And material poverty is when we, we don't have um, the things we need in life to be, the material things we need in life, food, shelter, transportation, um, to, to live meaningful lives. So that's material poverty. And that's what we typically think of when we talk about poverty. But relational poverty is also a significant issue. And that's when we lack the intimacy and connections that we need to live a meaningful life. So you could have people around you, but you, feel, you don't feel like people care. Or you don't feel like you have anybody around you that you can trust. That's relational poverty. And this is a growing problem in the West. I wouldn't say just in the United States. I would say in Europe, too. 
In fact, when I recently went to Norway and Germany for school, when we talked to the people in Norway, Norway is a country where no one wants for material things. They have plenty of money. They have oil. So everybody, everybody has lots of stuff. But over and over again, we heard people say the number one problem they're facing in Norway is loneliness. Because stuff doesn't fill that void. Stuff doesn't bring you connections with other human beings. And so this has happened for a number of different reasons across Europe and the United States. And I'll just briefly touch on this. There's a breakdown of the family. So when somebody, think about what happens when someone gets divorced. You know, maybe he gets these friends and she gets these friends and she gets the church. But there's a breakdown in relationships. And so it can lead to loneliness and isolation. Increased mobility. You think about it, so we move so much that sometimes people don't have the time to, to really establish roots, to, to build relationships with people in a community. There's the issue of heavy workloads. I mean, what do we say? If somebody asks you how you're doing, what do you typically say? I'm busy. I'm really busy. So we're, we're, we're so busy that we don't take the time really to build relationships with other people. And it increases um, isolation and loneliness. And finally, there's the whole thing of social media. And you, you think social media would help us be connected to one another. But the reality is you get a glimpse into somebody's life with social media, but it lacks intimacy. It's not real connection. So if you are not currently experiencing relational poverty, if you're not experiencing loneliness, chances are you know someone who is. And I want you to think about this because this is going to be a challenge at the end of this where you think about the people that you come into contact with on a daily basis, maybe at work, maybe at school, maybe in your family, maybe in your neighborhood, but you think maybe in our church, think about those people and think about who might be experiencing loneliness. And how do we love the people who are lonely? How do we, how do we show the love of Christ to the people who are experiencing loneliness? So we're going to look at three ways that were some of the most common ways that Jesus used to care for people who needed human connection. So how do we love the lonely? Number one, first we can love the lonely by touch, by touch. And that might sound strange. I'm going to explain myself here. Um, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 2, Jesus is approached by a man who has leprosy. And this is what it says. Suddenly, a man with leprosy approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, if you, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. So, Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. So what do we know about leprosy? So leprosy was a major problem during first century Palestine, the time of Christ. Um, it was a devastating illness. And those who had it were considered unclean. So if you had leprosy, you would have been ostracized from society. You wouldn't have been allowed in the temple. And you probably would have been shunned by your friends and family. So when, once you were diagnosed with leprosy, this, this was almost like a relational death sentence for you. You became an untouchable. So I want you to think about what that would have been like. So... Um, it's actually, they didn't know this then, but leprosy is actually caused by a bacteria. And it affects the nerves, but it also causes the flesh to literally rot off the body. So I chose not to show you pictures of this. I thought, you probably don't want to see that. You can Google it later if you're really curious. But it causes the flesh to rot off the, the body. And so what happens when is that people become deformed. You know, they get facial deformities. They're missing parts of their finger. Um, so here, and it's very, very contagious. Very contagious. So here this guy is. He's probably been cut off from his friends and family. But yeah, he has faith. And, and he trusts that Jesus can heal him. And he said, Lord, if you are willing, heal me. 
And then in verse 3, this is what Jesus does. Jesus reached out and touched him. Jesus reached out and touched him, and he said, I am willing, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. I want you to listen. To, he, Jesus reached out and touched him, and he said, I am willing. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Um, many of you know that, that over the last 10 years or so, I've, I've done a lot of work with homeless men. And um, I'm not doing it so much anymore because the men, we have a program director for the Men's Resource Center. But I've worked a lot with, with homeless men. And what I learned from that is that a lot of these guys, when you've been homeless, and you know they tend to be dirty, they're living on the street, maybe tend not to smell so good. They're so deprived of touch. They're so deprived of the human connection through touch. And when you work with them, and when you pray for them, and, and obviously I would use appropriate touch, and maybe on their shoulder or on their elbow or hold their hand when you're praying, sometimes they would start crying. Because it had been so long since anyone touched them. Because in our society, they're dirty and they smell bad and people just want to stay away. They, won't, they don't want anything to do with them. But there's something about human touch. We were designed to touch each other in appropriate ways. Yeah, that. So I want you to think about this guy that Jesus healed. He had rotting flesh falling off his body. And yet Jesus, he wasn't disgusted. He wasn't worried about becoming unclean. He reaches out and he touches him. Now, we know that Jesus healed people in many, many different ways. Jesus could just say the word and someone would be healed. He, he frequently, frequently would heal people and, and he wouldn't touch them. In fact, he would heal people from afar. He would say, yes, your daughter is healed. And they would go back to their house and truly she would be healed. I mean, he raised Lazarus from the dead without even seeing him. He was Lazarus within his home, and, and Jesus was, was not touching him. So we know that Jesus did not have to touch this man. He chooses to touch this man. I love it. I love the fact that, that um, the untouchable, is touched and cared for and loved by the Savior of the universe. And I think that's a powerful example for us. So most of us are familiar with Mother Teresa, right? So Mother Teresa was a nun in the Catholic Church, and most of her work was in Calcutta, India. And she worked with the lowest caste in India, which are called the untouchables. And she made a point to always touch people. I actually have a couple pictures. Let's see if we... There we go. So there she's touching a, a young boy who lives on the street. And there's one more. And that one she's touching um, an older man in a hospital. So these were people that, that were told their whole lives that they were untouchable. And yet she expressed Jesus' love through touch. And this is one of her quotes. She said this, Let us touch the dying, the poor, the lonely, and the unwanted according to the graces we have received, and let us not be ashamed or, sh or slow to do the humble work. So touch was so important. So that's one way that we can show love to the lonely is through touch. We can also show love to the lonely by listening, by listening. That's number two. So... Oftentimes, maybe, maybe you guys are better than I am at this, but we're in a conversation, and you can be in a conversation with someone and realize, I have no idea what they're saying. I have no idea what they're saying because we, our minds are somewhere else. But listening is so important. And I think the other thing we do sometimes when people are speaking to us, we're not really engaged. We're not really listening. We're thinking about what we're going to say next or maybe even interrupting them. But nothing says I love you and I care about you as a person than truly listening to what the other person has to say. 
So this was huge. And Jesus was a great listener. So in Luke 24, Luke 24, there were, there were two men walking along a road. We call it the road to Emmaus. And they're really downcast. They're really lonely. They're, they're very distraught. And then Jesus walks up to them. And this is after Jesus has been crucified. And they don't know that he's been resurrected yet. So Jesus walks up to them and they don't recognize that it's Jesus. So then starting in verse 17, Jesus asks them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? And they stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened here the last few days. Okay, so right here Jesus could have said, oh, I've heard about them. I lived them. You who, it's me, you recognize me, but he doesn't. He holds off. He really listens to them, and he asks them a question. He says, what things? The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said, he was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing. And they had seen angels who told them, Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. So they tell him the story, and he really listens. And, and he spends basically all afternoon and evening with them. And it wasn't until they break bread together that they recognize that this is Jesus. This is the resurrected Lord. You know, sometimes we don't have to be quick to speak. Jesus wasn't quick to speak. We simply need to meet people where they were. I think about this story. Jesus met these men where they were. He listened to their, their sorrow. He listened to their story. You know, there's something healing about having someone listen to your story. I mean, that's why people go to counseling. It, there's, there's a healing piece to, have some, to be able to tell your story and have someone really engage with you, really listen to you. You know, um, oftentimes people will come into my office with really, really difficult problems. I mean, really, really heavy stuff. And I can't fix it. I can't come close to fixing it. And sometimes there are issues, you know, they, maybe they, they owe a lot of money or, or they have this really horrible um, crisis in their family, and there's really not a lot I can do. And so I just listen, and I'll pray with them, and then I kind of send them on their way. And I used to feel really bad about that. Like, I wish I could do more. I felt so inadequate. And then about two years ago, I met this man, major problems, but we prayed. And he said, you're the first person who's really listened to me and prayed with me. And I feel so much better. And that just kind of changed my whole perspective that maybe when people come to my office, what they're coming for is not for me to fix their situation, but just to be heard, just to be listened to, because that has power. Because when people are listened to, they feel loved and cared for. So we love the lonely by touch. We love the lonely by listening. And number three, we love the lonely by offering our time, by offering our time. You know, Jesus had three and a half years of ministry, and he fit a lot in that three and a half years. Think about it. He healed people. He taught a lot of stuff. He, um, he preached. He prayed. He ate with people. He did, he did a lot. And he often tried to get away to pray by himself, but everywhere he went, everywhere he went, he was followed by this big crowd of people. And my guess is he didn't get a lot of rest. He was really really busy. 
One of my favorite stories is from Luke 5, and maybe you guys remember it. So Jesus was going into, it went into somebody's home, and he's teaching in this home. And it's packed with people. I mean, the people are like flowing out the front door. It's so full. And there are these guys who have a friend who's paralyzed. And they care very much about their friend. And they very much want their friend to encounter Jesus. Because they feel like if, if, they just, if he just encounters Jesus, that he'll be healed. But there was no way they were getting the friend in the house. So they managed to get the friend on the roof. And they all climbed to the top of the roof. And they create, make a hole in the roof. I bet the homeowner was thrilled. So they dig this hole, pretty large hole in the roof, large enough to lower their friend. And so they lower their friend right in front of Jesus. Now Jesus is preaching. He's busy. He's really busy with all these people. Jesus is preaching. And what I love about this story is Jesus doesn't say, stop, let me finish my message. He doesn't say, let me, let me get through point number three. And then, or, or he doesn't say, you guys are so out of order. He stops what he does, and he engages the man, and he heals him. He makes time for him. And I think about that because time is a really big deal. Giving people our time shows that we care about them. And so what I want to share with you tonight is whoever God puts in front of you, whoever God puts in front of you is God's assignment for you. Whoever God puts in front of you is God's assignment for you. We should never be too busy to take time for a divine interruption. We love people by giving them our time. So this holiday season, you know, think about it. For people who are lonely, for people who don't have human connection, for people who don't have good friends and family, the holiday season can be really painful. It only intensifies the loneliness. It only makes it seem all that much worse. So my challenge to each of us, to each of us in this room, is to think of one person, to pray for one person, for God to put someone on your heart, someone who's lonely this holiday season, that you can love through touch, through listening, or through time. Let's pray. Dear God, we love you, and we know that um, there are so many people in our community, in our church, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our schools, people who are lonely and hurting and feel isolated and have no real human connection. And God, I pray that we know that you love those people so much and we want to love them too. So we pray that, that you put someone on our heart and mind this holiday season, someone that we can reach out to. And, and then, Lord, you need to guide us in how you want us to reach out to them. But we trust you to do that. God, put someone on our heart and guide us as to how you want us to show your love. We love you and we give you glory. Amen. Okay, so now it's time to talk it out. You guys can go back to the table. We probably have enough for three or four tables. You'll find the yellow sheets of paper and you can discuss how to love the lonely. And for those of you who it's your first time, um, just join a group around the table and we'll have a, we have about we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for discussion.